So we ended up with this result where we have this vector, this is the state space vector, delta u, w, q, and delta theta. So those are the unknowns. They're the motion variables. And once we plug in all the parameters for the airplane, we just get numbers for all of this stuff here. So this is, this is state space form. So we've talked about for the mass spring damper state space form. But the form of this, I'm not gonna fill in the matrix on the board, is exactly what we looked at. And that's equal to this matrix we call the A matrix. And then a B vector or a B matrix. In this case, it's just an elevator. If you have multiple inputs like lateral directional, if we looked at that, we'd have aileron and rudder, so you'd have a two column matrix over here. Um, so this is the input, like the force on the mass spring damper system. These are the motion variables. And this is in the form of a vector dotted matrix times that vector plus B times delta E. So if we Laplace this, that's how we solve it. And you may look at it and go, well, how do you Laplace a matrix? The best way to think about it is this is just an equation across here, so you Laplace it. This is another equation, Laplace it, another equation, Laplace it, another equation, Laplace it. These are just numbers, so the constants go along for the right. You pull them outside the Laplace, right? So what it really means is that to Laplace this, the A matrix is just numbers, and you Laplace the vector and the vector there. But if, if that seems unnatural, you just Laplace each equation and then you stick it back in matrix form. So you get this Laplace thing that then we can solve. that. So that's the Laplace over there. You could also think of it in, in terms of vector form. Where now the vector here is the Laplace vector, states vector. And so if we use Kramer's rule to solve this, It means that we, to solve for the first unknown, oh, sorry, we can do some algebra first, my bad. Forget that. So now we wanna solve for this vector, so we have to get the delta u's, all of the delta u's over on one side. So we're gonna rearrange this. So if we move the A times the vector over to this side and write it as a matrix, we're gonna get S's along the diagonal because those multiply each of the state vectors.
like that. Let's keep the right hand side here. Like that, so I kept this. We got S times each one of those things in, in its spot. And then we have to subtract off each of the A elements. So here we'll write out each individual one. All right, so those are the individual elements of the A matrix. They're all minus because we shipped them over here. And that's exactly what that says. If we shove the A matrix on the left, we get minus signs in all front of all of the A elements. And then we simply add those two together. And this represents what we get. And then Kramer's rule. Says if we want to solve for the first unknown. We take the determinant with the first column replaced, divided by the determinant of this thing, which is S I minus A. All right, because S along the diagonal is S times the identity, and the A matrix is just everything else. And so for the partial fraction expansion, when we're solving this, we need the roots of that denominator. All right, think partial fraction expansion. We're going to factor that thing. It's a polynomial in S. The polynomial comes from multiplying all the S's in the matrix there. And then those are the roots that go into the factors into the polynomial that we do the partial fraction expansion on. And so that is the dynamics of the system. just like we did for the mass ring damper system because we get E uh, to the root times T. And if that root has a negative real part, it damps out. If it has an imaginary part, it's oscillatory. So we look at this root, real part, negative real part means stable, damped, and an imaginary part means oscillatory. So the whole process is pretty involved. You build your airplane, you develop all of the areas and lift curve slopes of all the systems and everything. You calculate all of those things that go into the A matrix. It takes a while. So most people, most companies develop a computer program that does that where you feed in your parameters of your aircraft and the aerodynamics. You calculate that matrix, then you calculate the roots of this thing that tell you the dynamics, and then you look at the roots and you say, oh, it's stable, it's not stable, it's oscillatory, it's not oscillatory. That's really, that's the process. And in fact, notice these are the eigenvalues of A, so that's the magic of, not magic, the convenience of the state space form that we've already gone through, but you see it again here, is that once you put your equations in the state space form, you're done. You don't have to do the partial fraction expansion to find your dynamics. I mean, if you actually wanted to write out the equation, you do, but if you wanna know whether it's stable or not, and it's oscillatory or not, you just put it in state space form, find the eigenvalues of A, and then you know what your dynamics are going to be because you know what the answers already look like.
So that's what I'm going to do next is we'll talk through what kind of different routes people usually get for aircraft. So we're going to talk about the common routes or the common modes of motion that most people see. And when you go into the aircraft industry, you'll hear people talking about this. They'll say, our airplane has this characteristics of its mode of motion in pitch. And they'll talk about whether it's good or bad and what they need to do to fix it. So these are common, and I'm going to put a bunch of words in here, roots of the characteristic polynomial. That's one thing we call them. Uh, we call these the eigenvalues of the A matrix because they're the same thing. Uh, they're the, the roots that go into the PF partial fraction expansion, uh, but in Dynamics, these are called the modes of motion. And so these are the common, all this stuff of aircraft. Oh, yep, thank you. I meant to do that after I erased. So there can be all kinds of different routes of our, for an airplane, but for most conventional design airplanes, uh, you get these kind of routes. So we're gonna use a biz jet. And we're gonna look at the longitudinal um, and this is from a different, different textbook, but it's, it's a, a Learjet. Not exactly a Learjet, it's an approximate Learjet model. And there's two sets of complex conjugate roots. So if we number them S1, S2, S3, S4, these are the two, this is S1 and S2. I'm just lazy because I don't want to write S again. I don't know why. So these look like this. And if you get imaginary roots, the algebra guys have known forever that if you have a polynomial with real coefficients, which we always do, because we don't have imaginary coefficients, you always get complex conjugate roots if you get imaginary. That's just what happens. And there's some math theorem that was proved hundreds of years ago that says that. So, for the BizJet, you plug in all of the aerodynamic and geometry parameters into that big state space matrix. You find the eigenvalues. And notice we get four. And we should expect that because going back over here, we have an S here, an S here, an S here, and an S here. So when we do the determinant, we're going to get S times S times S times S somewhere. And so we have a fourth order polynomial. So you get four roots. And that's because we have four equations. And that's always true with this state space form that if you have a four by four matrix, you're gonna get four roots. If you have a five by five, you get five roots. And because people like to name things when they talk about them rather than just saying, oh, remember that first and second route that we got for this airplane or the third and fourth route for this airplane, we name these. Um, and this one's called the fugoid. And that's actually a Greek word that means motion. And this is the most obvious one that you see in the airplane. It's, it takes a while to develop and it's the airplane going through the air up and down. So they notice this motion first, um, and it's characterized by 
a low frequency I guess we should say lower because it's lower than this one, right? This is a high frequency. I guess we should say higher frequency. So if you're looking at the two sets of roots, they don't necessarily come out in this order from the computer program or when you calculate them. So you look at the one that's the highest frequency and you pick that. And then the low frequency one is what we call the fugoid. And then people started calling this the short period. Period is the time that it takes to go through one oscillation. So if the frequency is higher, the period is shorter. And so they said, well, this one's shorter compared to this. So maybe they should have called it the shorter period and they could have called this the longer period, but they called this fugoid a long time ago and it's stuck. And you can do this yourself if you invent something or some kind of analysis, you can name it whatever you want. You can name it after yourself. Usually if, it, if things get named after people, it's because other people start using it, they associate it back with that person, and that's how that name gets attached to it. So I'm hoping you guys all get something named after you. Period, period, sorry. So that's called the short period because it's the higher frequency this is the fugoid because it's a lower frequency. Uh, the other way you can tell, these are complex, so you have to have complex. It also has a higher damping. Why? Because this real part here is bigger. So you get e to the minus one times t, whereas here you get e to the minus zero, zero, four, three t. So this one takes longer to damp out. So if we did a plot of this, we get a really fast frequency, but it damps out really fast. Whereas the fugoid takes a long time to go and it takes a while to damp out because the damping is low. This is smaller. So, if I gave you a set of roots and said these are the longitudinal roots of an airplane, you would look at them and you would pick the one with the biggest frequency and call that the short period. Makes sense. It's the short period. And then you'd say the other one is the fugoid. And then we would talk about, well, how do we like these roots? And uh, the FAA and NASA and the military have established the values that you need to see in these frequencies and damping that they found out pilots like or acceptable. And it's totally tied to the fact that they've flown a lot of airplanes and done a lot of simulation and had pilots evaluate airplanes with different modes of motion. And they found out which ones pilots are able to control the airplane best. So there's a set of specs. You will take this and you look at, at, a, at a chart and it will tell you whether this frequency meets the, the federal air regulation, aviation regulations, specifications for the short period mode. And the same thing for the fugoid. Because this is such a low frequency, it can have a low damping because an autopilot or a pilot will has, I mean, this is on the order of like 30, 40 seconds. So it's a slow motion and the pilot will just is able to correct for it. But you don't want it happening too much because then the pilot's having to fight that motion while he's trying to land an airplane and that's not good. All right, so that's a biz jet. The textbook also has a jet fighter. So let me show you the routes for that.
So what do you have to say about these? This what? Yeah, here we've got a positive real number. That's unstable. How about this one? Pretty big real number compared to like the ones we see on this. So we have a real number. This is nice, it's very well damped. How about this one? Based on our experience with the BizJet, we look at this frequency and we say, well, that looks kind of like a lower frequency. We don't have a frequency up here, but we have a well damped mode and the short period over there had a well damped mode, even though it was oscillatory. So we'd probably say this is the fugoid and this is the, we don't know. What the heck is this? And so if you were building this airplane, you could, you could call it a decoupled or a degraded short period mode and it's unstable. And so this is the main reason a lot of fighter aircraft have a pitch damper or some kind of autopilot and output feedback controller that will fix that unstable mode. And you'll learn about how to do that in 607 where it's automatic flight control and a flight control system, uh, a controller will sense the pitch motion, the theta and the alpha, feed it back and damp out. You can design a controller to stick onto the airplane with the sensors and have it stabilize the mode. So why did they allow the airplane to have this? It's like bad design, right? The what? Part of the deal is that, that they can tailor the, the response of the aircraft. The more stable it is, the less responsive sometimes it is for dogfights. The other issue is that this fighter aircraft was designed for the low speed landing and takeoff, but it also goes Mach 1.5, Mach 2. And so there were a lot of aerodynamic trade-offs that they had to make to allow this airplane to fly at Mach 2. Delta wing. So the aerodynamics drove this and gave not great dynamics, but then they fix up the dynamics because they can do that. So the aero design and the flight envelope design drove this and so then they had to deal with this because it was just part of allowing this airplane to fly that fast. Uh, so what are these modes physically? I think it's, if you can, it's important to connect the math to what's actually going on. Hopefully as engineers, you guys like to do that. I think maybe that's why I became a mechanical or an aerospace engineer rather than an electrical engineer. Because in electrical engineering, you can't really see the electrons doing their thing, right? You have instruments, you have a voltmeter, an amp meter, and an oscilloscope and all that that help you see what's going on, but you can't, it's harder to visualize. So let's see, the, the fugoid mode is a trade-off between potential and kinetic energy of the aircraft. So let's, I'm not over on that board, am I? So let me demonstrate this with the airplane. But we'll write, this is a potential energy, kinetic energy trade-off. Because the fundamentals of physics say energy is always conserved. So if you lose kinetic energy, then you get potential energy and vice versa, unless there's some dissipation. All right, so the way this thing works, this mode, the fugoid mode, the airplane's flying along and maybe it gets a forward gust, a forward speed gust, small perturbation. And so the increase in Q, the dynamic pressure, increases the lift and the airplane starts to climb. Well, there's potential energy increasing. 
which means kinetic energy is decreasing because you're climbing, but you haven't increased the thrust. And so you have a net force imbalance. So the airplane is going to slow down. Because the gravity vector is now acting partially backward. We learned that in 324 with climbing flight, you need more thrust to climb because you're going up. So the airplane is going up and it's losing airspeed. So it loses that airspeed it got from the gust and then it overshoots and slows down below the flight speed trim point. So then the lift goes down. So the airplane starts to fall and then it gains speed because now it's falling and then the lift goes up and then it starts climbing again. So that is the fugoid mode. And it happens slowly because the inertia of the aircraft takes a while for that velocity change to happen once it starts climbing, right? It will start climbing and it takes a while for it to slow down. And so that's why the period is long. It's a long porpoising motion through the air. So if you write down, it's a, it's a, a cycle oscillation. It looks like this, what we just talked through. Is, let's see, the airspeed goes up which leads to the lift going up because you have more dynamic pressure, which means the airplane climbs, uh, which means as it climbs, it loses airspeed, which means, let's see, that should be a double arrow. Then it, the lift goes down, um, which means the airplane descends, uh, which means you pick up airspeed and now you're back where you started. All right, so what's the short period mode? Low frequency, it's a high frequency. Um, and so this is mainly tied to velocity and pitch angle. So let's write that up. The big players here are velocity and theta. Velocity changed, pitch angle changed, we climb, the velocity slows down. So this is a trade-off between velocity and angle. So this thing up here, is essentially a response to CM alpha pitch stability. And so it mainly involves alpha and theta. So U, the U variation is small. Whereas down here, it turns out the alpha variation is small. And we'll take advantage of that. We'll say, well, gee, if in this mode, alpha doesn't really matter, we can throw the alpha degree of freedom out and knock that four by four down to a two by two. And up here, we can say, oh, we don't need to worry about velocity. Throw that equation out, throw that variable out, and we can knock it down to a two by two. So we'll talk about that probably next time. So this thing is a response to an alpha gust so alpha increases, and then the CM alpha, assuming we're stable, is going to try to reduce that alpha back down, right? That's pitch stability. And so that means that alpha goes down, theta goes down, but then you get an overshoot. Because it doesn't just perfectly come down and stop, like sometimes happened with the mass. We can't get enough damping and still have pitch response. So it will overshoot, which means that alpha goes down. And then the CM alpha stability then pushes alpha back up in response to the alpha overshooting and going down. So it's, and it happens fairly quickly compared to the fugoid because it's just the airplane going like this as opposed to this. So you get an alpha gust, Airplane pitches down, it overshoots, and so now alpha's below the trim point, so CM alpha wants to bring it back to the trim point, and it does this pretty quickly through the sky.
So I'll post this on Blackboard. There's a, a plot of the short period in the fugoid. And really it's just showing that it's that alpha and theta are changing and it shows how the velocity vector changes and how it pitches up and down. And then this is the fugoid. Notice the, the distance here. This thing happens over 8,000 feet of forward flight and the short period is over 80 feet. So this happens fast, this happens slow, and you get the trade-off between um, the velocity and alpha stays pretty much constant. Well, this is what I really want to show you. I need to share my screen. Hang on. Okay. Now I've lost my chat, haven't I? Yeah, I'll see if I can get the video posted. I'm working on getting the put ones from last week and Monday posted. I switched the board, so we're good there. Okay. I don't know why you guys are having such a reaction to the shot. All I did was went home and then I laid down on the floor of my living room and two hours later, I didn't have the energy to get up and go to bed. <laughs> that was after my second shot. So I totally understand it. It will knock you out for a little while. Uh, you can see this, right? So this is a MATLAB Simulink simulation of the jet. And what, once we get the transfer functions from that state space, or you can put the state space equations in here directly, what you can do is feed in an elevator pulse. So the airplane's trimmed, and then we pulse the elevator positive, but pulses down and then back up real quick. And that's what's shown in this plot. This is elevator versus time. So at one second, elevator down and back up, like it's called a stick wrap. The pilot will do this. And it excites the dynamics of the airplane because that's a perturbation on the steady state flight. And here's the velocity, pitch angle, and alpha. So this is the full four degree, three degree of freedom, four by four matrix, no approximations, no modes, but you see the modes are in there because the velocity has this long period motion and that's the fugoid. And this is the kind of thing they saw when they first started flight testing aircraft is that they would do an elevator change and the airplane would go through this motion. And then they could calculate the period, right? You can take the peak here minus the peak here in time and you can get, looks like about 80 minus 20, about 65 seconds. And that's the period that you can convert to the frequency that matches the mode that we would calculate. How about theta? Well, theta's got something really fast going on here, but then you get some slow motion here as well. Notice the time scale is, is compressed, or sorry, is, is zoomed in. So if you followed this motion, you'd get the same period that we see up here over 100 seconds. So theta and u are in this fugoid mode, but then this fast stuff, that's the short period. And the main response is alpha. You can see alpha goes through a full cycle in about one and a half or two seconds. If we converted that to the frequency that we see there, it would be pretty close to that frequency. And this happens in theta and alpha, but you see hardly anything happening in the velocity because it happens so fast that the velocity with the inertia, the mass of the airplane, it doesn't change. So these modes really do exist. And if you take an airplane up and fly it and do a stick wrap, you will see these modes of motion in the telemetry. So the next set of modes, I think I'll probably just get the roots written up here and then we'll talk about them next time, are lateral directional. Because we've got the other degrees of freedom. We've got the roll, the bank angle and the roll rate and the yaw rate and the side slip because we've been dealing with alpha. So this is the other set of the six degrees of freedom equation. So in the book, go through the exact same process, which takes a long time. And you get this set 
of state space equations for the lateral directional flight in terms of side velocity, which is proportional to beta, the roll rate, the yaw rate, and the bank angle, which is related to the roll rate. So the state vector for this is V, P, R, and theta. You calculate all the numbers in here, find the eigenvalues of that matrix, which give you the roots of the characteristic polynomial, and then you analyze them. So if you do that for the bisjet, I still got, what, two minutes. Okay, I'll write a few of these up here and then we'll talk about them next time. So we're talking about lateral directional modes. We've got Stable, oscillatory. We've got real, barely stable, could be a problem. And we've got that one, super stable, no problem whatsoever. So we'll rewrite these up on the board next time. We'll give them names um, and talk about what's good and bad about them.